Welcome to the Your Pennsylvania Ancestors podcast. In this episode, we talk with Lee Arnold, Chief Operating Officer of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Many genealogy researchers consider the Historical Society of Pennsylvania a must-do archive, and you'll find out why in this episode. Lee shares with us all the various pieces of his collection at the Historical Society and what you can expect when you go to research there. HSP is a special place and you'll feel like you step back in time when you walk through its doors. I hope you get a little glimpse of that in this episode. I'd love to hear your comments and questions about the episode. So go to www.paancestors.com and click on leave a question. There's a little microphone there and you'll get to leave an audio and I just might use it on a future episode of the podcast. And now here's Lee Arnold with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Lee Arnold, welcome to um, the podcast. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved at the Historical Society and working there, what your role is? And um, of course, people always want to know, do you have any ancestors in Pennsylvania? (laughs) (laughs) Those are all really great questions. So um, I just uh, celebrated my 27th year here at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Uh, And... um, uh, I, uh, of course, I started back in 1992, and I just answered an ad in the newspaper back when there still were newspapers and they still put classified ads in to, for, to, for a library director. And I started off as just um, being over the books, pamphlets, and serials, a, a traditional library. And then the position has morphed uh, over the years where I am now uh, uh, in charge of all the collections at HSP, so all of the uh, books, pamphlets, serials, but all the manuscripts, all the graphics, you know, the archival collections, and we even have a few remaining museum collections, mostly in the form of paintings that are on the wall in our reading room. Um, and then in 2015, I also became the chief operating officer, so I'm in charge of facilities and personnel. So it's a it's a a lot of work. A lot of work. <laughs> Sounds like it. It, it, it is. Yeah, because HSP is a a big facility. It's got a lot going on. I mean, there's a lot when when you walk yep. in as a researcher. There, there's multiple layers of information available, um, and you cover the entire state of Pennsylvania plus the adjoining states. You do have records from adjoining states: Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey. That, that, yeah. That's right. So um, our, our, our name belies us a little bit uh, in the sense of our, our collections really reflect our history and the history as an organization. So in 1892, the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania was formed at HSP, sort of as a Friends of Genealogy group of the Historical Society. And they collected for every state east of the Mississippi River. And uh, we've had some interesting relationships back and forth with GSP uh, since that time. Uh, They are a separate organization, and for a long time they were housed in our building. They now have an office in Northeast Philadelphia. Um, But they gave all of their collections to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So for genealogy, we still collect for every state east of the Mississippi River. Now, I am the first um, Arnold of my branch of Arnold's to ever have set foot in Pennsylvania. But I found my own ancestors in our South Carolina collection. My, I had an ancestor in the South Carolina militia during the Revolutionary War. And then in our Tennessee collection, I found a land uh, deed. Uh, as my ancestors moved from the Carolinas into Tennessee, ultimately into southern Illinois, in northern Illinois, and then southern Wisconsin, where I grew up in southern Wisconsin. So it's an interesting thing. 
the other thing that shapes our collecting has been in 2002 when we merged with the Balsh Institute for Ethnic Studies. The Balsh was founded in 1976 as a coast-to-coast, -coast, Atlantic to Pacific, um, uh, documenting ethnic immigration into the United States. They covered 60 official ethnic groups. Now, when they merged with us, that was a pretty big ambition, uh, Atlantic to Pacific immigration collecting. So we looked at their collections and saw that they were really heavily, really the mid-Atlantic, sort of New York down to Virginia. So for when it comes to ethnic immigration documentation, we sort of stick to the mid-Atlantic area. And then for your basic garden variety history, that's more of the Pennsylvania, northern counties of Delaware, South Jersey, that sort of, that, that sort of thing. I had no idea that you had records. I mean, east of the Mississippi was considered in your purview, and that yeah, you, yeah that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and part of it is again our our history is that uh, we have very meager acquisition funds, but the funds we have are all endowed, meaning. You mm. gotta spend them on that, uh, so um, and that's great because it protects us from the the marketplace and um, and our, our our general funding. But the the quirky thing is that that these endowed funds were left to us in people's wills in the late 1800s, early aughts, early 19 aughts, mm -hmm. and they're very very specific. So I have one fund just to only purchase things on North Carolina. So we have a huge North Carolina collection. <laughs> uh, my joke is, and it's true, but in his will, uh, Mr. Uh, Lanier says, um, I, want, I leave you um, this money in perpetuity to buy uh, books on the state of my birth. So I'm just assuming it's North Carolina as opposed to, you know, buying things about cesarean sections or things like that or Lamaze methods of birth. Uh, that sort of state of his birth. So that's North Carolina. And then we have a, um, a fund left to us by Mr. Lamberton to only buy books on Scots-Irish immigration. I have a, a fund left by Mr. De La Roche to only buy books on French North American history. And it goes on and on like that. So some of our collections, you would be surprised that we have them here, but it's because thoughtful people left us in their wills over 100 years ago. <laughs> I, I am surprised and, I, and I'm laughing to myself because if those men could have foreseen what would be the case <laughs> in 2019, you know, that the Historical Society of Pennsylvania is swimming in North Carolina, you know, records. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Who would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought? Well, uh, a shout out. I know a researcher out by Pittsburgh who ha traces family to North Carolina. And well, send I'll, them over. Send yeah, them over. yeah. I'll have to send her over because uh, North Carolina having, you know, so many burned courthouse records from the Civil right. War. She, yeah. she uh, has been very creative in using state level records. And um, luckily in Pennsylvania, we don't have that much governmental record loss. Uh, but, you know, definitely for people, they always, she's a great presenter because she always gives us creative ways to, to kind of get around uh, th things that we're not finding, you know, in, in normal places. Um, yep. But back, back to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, um, I do want to ask about for a first time researcher who's maybe done most of their research on ancestry or family search and, yep. and worked only with digital records online yep. and, and yep. typing things into that search box. Yep. What can they expect when they come to the historical society for the first time? So one of the things is um, I always try to tell people, and we have working relationships with Ancestry.com, Find My Past, and family search. So um, we have uh, uh, good relationships with all three organizations, two of which, uh, Ancestry and Find My Past, are commercial for profit companies, and FamilySearch.org is a nonprofit. So, however, I do have a beef with, with Ancestry, which is, you know, uh, they, you know, one of their lines, you know, you, you, you can't watch. Uh, you know, TV at night without hearing an Ancestry.com commercial. It's like, all you need to do is type. It's like, oh, you need to do a lot more than know how to type. And if you limit 
you know, your research just to an online database, you really are limiting. Now, what they do is they, they add spice to it by saying, look, I found all my cousins in Ireland, and I went there, and they treated me, and I had beer, and it was wonderful. Well, all right. Um, uh, I, I do uh, DNA testing myself. I would never think of uh, putting it out there because I don't want people calling me saying, hey, I'm your cousin. Can I stay with you in Philly? No, uh, <laughs> you're not going to do that. But, but the thing is when they come in the door, we're going to show you real documents, documents that have not uh, been you know, uh, added to databases. Some have been added to databases, but you're going to go and, and you look at the originals. Or, but you're mostly going to find items that are going to be new to you. Um, and, uh, and you're going to be a detective. And you're going to be looking at these things. And you're going to be seeing sometimes the handwriting of your ancestor. And you're going to be finding perhaps some photographs, or you're going to be finding where they lived in the city, and you're going to find an insurance policy for their house. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they had, you know, a lanai back then, or something like that. <laughs> you're going to, it's going to be, it's going to be, um, it's going to be eye-opening. It really is. Yeah, and that that's a wonderful story, and I and I share your same position about ancestry and the and the marketing around it um yep. the one that gets me is the woman does dna testing and she finds out she's related to george washington it's just oh, it's just yeah. that simple it's like in, yeah. you know what's in 20 oh. minutes um yeah. and and genealogy is detective work it, it is yep. and and it's enjoyable detective work in that you do find especially at the historical society of pennsylvania things like documents you don't even know exist like you were saying insurance policies you know yep. uh Genealogy research other researchers did, and their notes are in your closed stacks. And right, you, that's yeah. right, that's right. I've come across that a couple times uh, researching for uh, clients as well as for myself, and it's I don't know. There's just something really amazing to find to find out that, that there was someone else researching the people you're researching with the care and generosity that they had, you know, yeah, did at the yeah. time, and you're kind of walking down their same set of tracks. That's it's right, that's right. Wonderful. What has been something, uh, I, I always think our, an, an archivist, you know, collection manager, there's no way that they've read through everything in their institution, right? So, right. you know, you're discovering along with the patrons, you know, or the researchers. So what's been yep. something that someone discovered that just absolutely floored you? Like you were like, wow, I didn't know we had that or, you know, that that fact existed, you know, for the, for these, uh, this family, this researcher. Well, one of the things that I wasn't aware of, and I had a researcher uh, last week asking me to clarify something, and not only could I not clarify it, because I never heard of it before, but, um, and, uh, you know, after 27 years, I'm never embarrassed by saying, I did not know that. Uh, because my, the, what I also sort of tell people is, is, if we have 21 million items here at HSP, and if I knew every item, uh, I would be a genius and probably controlling the world in some sort of James Bond sort of way. Uh, uh, so, um, so he said to me, what are these things called a Virginia certificate? And I'm like, I never heard of a Virginia certificate. Well, this was part of a land dispute between Virginia, now West Virginia, uh, and Washington County, what is now Washington County, Pennsylvania, about is it in Pennsylvania? Is it in Virginia? That sort of thing. And in order to, um, you could claim your land, except if someone had an earlier Virginia certificate. So it, it would say, you know, deed approved pending Virginia certificate. And so this is something that I didn't know, and we had some information about that. And so the researcher and I sort of pieced it together and, and he taught me something and I was able to find a book dealing with some early Virginia land claims in Pennsylvania. Again, a book I didn't know that we had, but based on his query. And so that was something that was really, really good. And then he was able to, he's working on a certain line of his ancestors who were in this border region. So that was something very new to me and, mm. uh, and I learned something. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I love the detective work there, you know, yeah. on, on both your parts, you know. Um, 
And that brings up a question. So a researcher like that, he came in with a question, what is a Virginia yeah. certificate? What other kind, what should people bring when they come to HSP? What, what, what does it look like? What's a good, a good researcher look like when they walk in your door? Well, a good researcher has a good idea about what they're looking for. I mean, I always get um, someone coming up to the reference desk and I do so many hours of reference desk a, a week. So I want to, A, because we're short staff, and B, I really want to know what my staff are dealing with on a daily basis. What are mm. the kind of questions? What are, what are the trends? And so they'll say, you know, I, so they'll say um, you know, I'm looking for um, a death certificate. And then I would say, you know, can you narrow that down? you know, 1720, 1820, 1920, you know, you know, uh, last year, I mean, give me an idea of what kind of death certificate you're looking at, or I'm trying to find, you know, you know, they'll, again, they'll say, I'm trying to find my family. And again, I've just met this person. So I'm like, you know, Irish, are they, you know, uh, are they Italian? Are they African? You know, tell me what, you know, narrow it down, you know, a, a little bit. So, you know, you really have to get some basic things because even though you know your family and you know that you're German or Swiss or something, the reference librarian isn't going to have a clue of, of, of what you're sort of looking for and what area you're looking for and the time. So I would say, you know, give me an ethnic group, give me a time frame, and give me a geographic area, and then I can start pointing you in the right direction. Excellent. Excellent advice. So really exhaust sort of the records that are available through online research or, you know, your own mm -hmm. things and then bring, bring that in. So yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the folks at HSP, the, the staff can get you set in the right direction. So HSP has a couple different layers to it. So it's got the, is it called the family history room? Is that correct with the genealogies? Yeah. That's um, right. Yeah, we have about 10,000 published genealogies in the family history room. That's correct. Yeah, it, absolutely fantastic. And like, and like really high quality genealogies. These aren't just like, I mean, there's a few that are names and dates, but a lot of these things are very extensive, well-researched, uh, yep. cover broad spans of time and associated families. I, um, and in the HSP catalog, they have cataloged in all the surnames within a genealogy. I've noticed even if the, uh, we'll just use the dreaded surname of Smith, um, yeah. if those Smiths married uh, Wolves, uh, Geigers, uh, you know, whatever, they're also included, which is fantastic. Um, and then you have the Pennsylvania room, and that room is records that are uh, books mostly uh, that people can just pull off the shelf and just look at in terms of church records, county records. Anything else I'm missing in the Pennsylvania uh, room? No, nope. the the family history room. Uh, it, it, as I said, it has uh, prim almost primarily uh, published family histories, and some people can say, "Well, yeah, you have that," and but you know, the New York Public Library also has the Johnson family history published in 1920, and you know, um, family published in 1940. And, you know, so what's special about a lot of these published family histories are very unique and had limited publishing runs, like maybe 40 copies or something like that, 40 or 50. Mm. And so a lot of them aren't around anymore. And again, yes, you might find that there's a library in Kentucky that has one, there's one in Missouri, but we have them all under one roof. So it's a really sort of one-stop shopping. So that's good. Our Pennsylvania room has Pennsylvania and New Jersey materials that are out in the open questions to us, we had to sort of lock Delaware up, uh, uh, expand beyond the family history room, and so R through Z is actually around the uh, sides of the Pennsylvania room. And so, and we have two types of things in the Pennsylvania room. We have published books, um, and then we also have uh, ledgers. These are handwritten, hand compiled uh, ledgers of local, um, uh, primarily sectarian records compiled by the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania. So those are all in the open sh uh, shelves as well. Oh, excellent. Um, then you also have a, a microfilm room. 
Yes, and um, I was just uh, uh, came from our annual general meeting, and one of the statistics I provided our president was that we reshelved 833 microfilm reels last year. Uh, people who think, oh, microfilm is dead, everyone uses things online, it's like, well, don't tell that to my staff, we reshelved 800 uh, reels of film last year. So <laughs> it, uh, film is still being used. We have... Um, a lot of ethnic newspapers on microfilm, thanks to the Balsh Institute, and then a lot of microfilm dealing with genealogy, and thanks to the Genealogical Society. Oh, before I forget, the closed yeah. stacks, that's the, the kind of the, the part that uh, a researcher does not see. Yep. So what is in the closed stacks, and how does someone access that? Yeah, so our closed stacks actually are the majority of our collections, all the way up to the fourth floor. Um, part of it, it's intentional to have separate storage areas, and that was part of our early fireproof remedy uh, plan, uh, so that if uh, each of those areas are enclosed, so that if something happened to one, you would the rest of the collection would be safe. Mm. And uh, and those include not only uh, books, but also all manuscript and graphic materials and atlases and things like that. So in order to use those materials, um, in our online catalog, it'll say closed stacks. And you just have to put down an identifying number. If it's a book, it's a call number, plus you know the author title, something to give us an idea if there's more than one item in that call number. Or if it's a collection, you would put down you know the collection number, and you would say, I want a, a letter from John Adams from this. For folks that are new to researching in, a, in an archive like yours, I mean, yes, the, the pull slip uh, system is, it can be, for some people, a little intimidating, yep. um, but the, the, there is staff there to help. They're incredibly yep. friendly. They're very warm. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the, they're, they're used to new, newbies, new people coming in, yep. and just ask, you know, questions. They'll let you know if you didn't put enough information down, and, you know, just pick your favorite number seat. Uh, whatever your lucky number is that day, and then uh, go ahead. I wanted to mention, too, for people uh, while they're there in that reading room, uh, there is reference books all along the walls of those shelves. Uh, Absolutely. For, yeah, and they're wonderful because I, I know I've discovered um, all kinds of things that I'm so used to some of those titles being at, you know, any genealogical society, uh, but you have things that... I, I've never seen other places, and it's just fun to walk through and go, well, look at that, <laughs> pull it down, and look, and read it, and, you know, learn yeah, something yeah. new, and, so. And that is, uh, of our four rooms uh, that are open to the public, our four uh, stack areas, so we talked about the family history room, the Pennsylvania room, the microfilm room, but the last one, of course, is our reference room, uh, our reading, what we call our reading room. It's a wonderful, archaic uh, term, because, um, what I always t uh, ask when I get teenagers in, I'm like, what do you think people do in a reading room? And then they'll sheeply say, read? Yes, they read. And uh, so um, in our reading room, uh, in our reading room is our reference collection, everything from how-to books, like how to find your Cherokee ancestors, to passenger lists, to the history of areas, um, you know, general sort of histories of, uh, of different areas of Pennsylvania or areas that we collect genealogically. Um, uh, we also have, you know, uh, city directories uh, for convenience. Uh, take a look at, uh, uh, you can find your ancestor and where they lived and their occupation. So a, a lot of really good, uh, good material in those areas. Yeah, it, yeah, thank you for filling out that explanation because it's you know what people can expect so when a researcher comes they definitely should expect to spend a solid chunk of time there you know four hours yeah. is not unreasonable you know right. if they can book yeah. longer book longer um so they you can allow as a researcher for serendipity and discovery because <laughs> you, know? yeah. yeah. right. um, you, you just don't know what necessarily what you're going to find or what this and what the staff can recommend to you based on your research so what percentage of all this, this 21 million records, is digitized? Everyone loves to talk about digital records and things being online. So w what's your guess on what's, what's uh, online? I think it's probably around 15,000 is, is available online through our digital library. So it's really just a very, very small uh, uh, percentage of the 21 million. 
Okay. So word to, re word to beginning genealogists, intermediate genealogists, get to your archives. <laughs> Right, You're right. missing out on the majority of records that are that are have been kept and preserved for research. Right, and one of the things I because we get um, sometimes we get uh, high school teachers bringing their students in to in, uh, acquaint them with uh, original research and college students, and and I say the same thing to both groups of young people. It's like there's a whole world out there beyond your screen. Um, I still talk about a computer screen. I know that young people are now tweeting or twerking or whatever it is they are with their phones, but they think if it's not there, it just doesn't exist. And I think, oh, you're missing out. You are missing out so much mm -hmm. on, um, on, on life. It's sort of, you know, here's, I just thought of this right now. It's sort of like, you know, a dating app. You know, if you think that the only people available out there to date or be a future spouse are people, you know, who have this profile online, you know, it's like, well, you might be missing someone else, you know, who goes to your stamp collecting club or your church or, or you meet at the dog park when you're walking your dog. You know, you're missing out if you think your life is going to revolve around a screen and the information provided there. Um, in, for genealogy, that's certainly the case, but in just in research in general, um, you know, if you're trying to you know, find original letters from Indian agents to uh, to the uh, you know to the Seminole people. Um, you're, it's not going to be online. You're going to have to go into an archive and find it. And mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's the same thing in life. You just put the. I always say to kids, put the phone down and look up, and <laughs> um, you'll be surprised. There you go. I think it, it might be a, a that might be a T-shirt. It might be a, a slogan <laughs> we could put on a T-shirt. It was those moments of researching in person in archives that I've made my kind of not just discoveries like oh wow look at that, but uh, really a transformation of understanding like who I am oh, and yeah. who like what our country is and like what actually happened. Like it's just it, there's just all this detail and everything. So for you, what, what have you discovered in your 27 years, you know, at HSP and, and going through records? Like what's been transformational for you? Well, I think, you know, I, I was tempted, I think like a lot of people are and sort of like companies like Ancestry do with something um, like you're going to find something really special about yourself, you know, and, and mine was, uh, my father always said that we had Native American ancestry. Um, I'll cut to the chase. We don't, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, that was like, ooh, yes, maybe I was, you know, you know, I was Choctaw or something, uh, you know, ancestor. So, uh, but, but that's what sort of gets you started, just like, you know, these commercials, like, you know, my ancestor was an Irish fisherman with blue eyes, you know, just like me. And um, so you think of these things, but what I found um, was really um, uh, how wonderfully ordinary I am, uh, in the sense that um, that my the history of my uh, family was really um, the history of this country, where you had people who left Europe for a better life, a better mm -hmm. life for themselves, and a better life for their children. And in my case, my mother's family were uh, uh, German Lutherans who came into northern Wisconsin and, and lived in, and sort of established, you know, Luther, you know Lutheran farms, uh, meaning in Lutheran churches. And my mother only spoke German until she went into uh, kindergarten. She didn't speak any English because German was the language of the church in Wisconsin uh, where she lived and, and, uh, and her, um, her family. And then my father, how they were Scots-Irish and they came into the Carolinas and, and they followed that sort of migration. Uh, you know, through the Appalachians, keep heading west and things like that. And so, um, you know, my, I mentioned that he was a, in the South Carolina militia, and the only thing it says is that he lost his horse. Now, I grew up on a horse farm, and when I lost my horse, it just meant that the horse uh, got back to the barn before I did, and someone had explained to me, you know, Lee, the horse was shot out from under him. I'm like, oh, that's what you mean, lost his horse. But, I, you know, other than that, you know, these are just, you know, average folk, and and there are so many stories like that of average folk, and that's what our our the fabric of this nation is made up of. And and in one sense, I'm very 
pleased about that. I'm very pleased about that. And one of the things is I do genealogy, and I just sort of looking at these people and thinking, you know, what is the price that they paid so that I could, you know, get a better education, for instance. Um, I'm the first uh, male in my family to graduate from college. I'm also, the, you know, I also ended up in later life, just a few years ago, uh, getting a doctor's degree. Uh, again, something unheard of. Uh, my father graduated from the sixth grade and was illiterate most of his life. He came from a family of sharecroppers. So, but if he, and his, you know, if his ancestors and he didn't work hard and did what they did, I wouldn't have been here to be able to, you know, try to make my life a little better or my life a little easier. Um, so it's it's just it's a wonderful story, and I'm very appreciative for uh, for the price that my ancestors paid to to be here. That's that's absolutely beautiful. It it's so true. It's researching ancestors to look for glory is kind of you know or attach yourself to your ancestors yeah. glory or or accomplishments you kind of lose something if that's yep. the intention and and really just looking with open eyes and just seeing who they were and being appreciative of how you got here is is a great a, a great way to go about it I, yeah i really appreciate you sharing that well i want to thank you for your time today i know you just returned from a trip uh, and, <laughs> and have, I'm sure, a lot to get back to if you're like everyone, you have a, a stack of email and, and people wanting your time. So um, thank you for sharing what the Historical Society of Pennsylvania is about, what people can expect when they go. Uh, any future uh, changes coming to the Historical Society that you want to make people aware of? Well, I, I think we're, we're um, uh, I think Sometimes just holding steady is an accomplishment. Uh, is an accomplishment yes. of, uh, itself. So if I can at least maintain, uh, 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 you know, we have a very small staff, and as long as we can maintain our current public hours, uh, I think that's an accomplishment. Uh, you know, given sort of um, the plight of, of private research libraries today. Uh, mm -hmm. So so that is good. But we um, have a wonderful. Um, uh, Partnership with FamilySearch.org, where they have volunteers here uh, scanning our genealogical material, um, and and also more important, they've also scanned a million of our uh, card catalogs. Again, another thing I like surprising teenagers with is, look at the card catalog, <laughs> and they have no idea what I'm talking about. But our million cards, 60% of which are handwritten are only available in the card catalog. And so our friends at Family Search not only scanned all million cards, but it, they're in a multi-year process where they're keying them in. So at some point, you'll be able to see, oh, we have a letter from John Adams to Abigail Adams on this date. Now, you still have to come here to look at that letter, but at least you'll know that we actually own that letter. Um, you know, you can look at that um, knowledge from your living room, whereas uh, right now, you actually have, have to come into HSP, thumb through the card, and say, oh, I'd like to see that letter. So, uh, so that's one of the things that is happening, which we're really excited about. We'll never throw the cards away. We'll put them in archival boxes. They'll go on a shelf forever. Um, but but that's, um, that's a project that we're very thankful that Family Search is helping us with. Oh, excellent. So something to look forward to there. And Indeed. yes, and thank you for keeping the ship sailing, <laughs> so to speak, and keeping <laughs> it welcome. going. I, 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 for one, kind of dislike change in some things. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you don't have any big changes like coming yeah, up. Like, okay. Yeah, so thank you. I'd like to thank Lee for his time this morning and for a really fun conversation about the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I hope you see, like I do, that it's a really great place to go and do research and find some really special things that you just might not find other places. If you're lost and confused in your Pennsylvania research, and just can't find that ancestor, take a couple minutes, leave me an audio question on my website, 
and I'll answer it on a future episode of the podcast. Go to www.paancestors.com and click on leave a question. Thank you for listening, and I'd love it if you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.